Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church. I am Sarah, the pastor for this Sunday. And then next week uh, is Laity Sunday, as declared by our bishop, Bishop Sue Halpert Johnson. And then on the first Sunday in July, Communion Sunday, Pastor Christy will be with you. So yesterday at the conclusion of annual conference, which was held in Hampton this year, the bishop fixed the appointments. And I got to see in this, on the screen that it is official that I'm going to Warwick Memorial United Methodist Church in Newport News and that Pastor Christy Haga Turner is coming to Crozet United Methodist Church. So it has been officially fixed by the bishop and uh, we are now in this kind of period of transition. Um, some of you who have been sitting here for a little bit got to see the excitement of moving um, our other baptismal font over here. Uh, at, nine, at our nine o'clock contemporary worship service, we had a full immersion, an adult immersion of Pam Garrison. And uh, this time we will also have a beautiful baptism, but it will not be an immersion. Uh, we will be doing our, our more traditional sprinkling of um, baptism for uh, Miss Lexi over here a little while in our worship service. And as we go through this day, it is an opportunity for us to reflect on the journey that we have had over the past eight years together and what God is doing now as a new thing. And so very grateful to be with you this morning. As we begin, I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in the call to worship, which you will find on the screen. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. 
We invite you to remain standing as you are able as we sing our opening hymn from the United Methodist Hymnal number 398, Jesus Calls Us. standing as you are able. Let us join together in the unison prayer, which you will also find on the screens. Most merciful Father, send your heavenly blessings upon this your church, that in all its members may dwell together in unity and love. Keep far from us all self-will and discord, and do your pastors with righteousness and enable them faithfully to fulfill their ministry, to bring again the outcasts and the seek the lost, and to grant to us so to receive their ministrations and use your means of grace, that in all our words and deeds we may seek your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. Let us join together in the glory of Patri. Good morning. Hi, I'm Sandra Monahan, your traditional worship lay leader. I um, want to extend a special welcome to any visitors today. And if you see these little cards in the pew and would mind filling one out, I would love to connect with you this week by email and share about our ministries. Um, at this time, we'd love for the children to come forward, if anyone's coming forward for the children's worship, um, if you'd like. And for everyone else, to please turn to your neighbor and pass the peace of Christ. Thank you. what I have for you. So we're thinking about how today is my last day as the pastor, but there's going to be a new pastor here. And so I have something I want to show you. Have you ever seen rocks like these? You ever seen any rocks like these? What's different about them? What do you think? They're teal. Yeah, they're a different color, right? I love that you knew that they were teal. Fantastic, right? But notice they're a little sharp, right? They're, they're not real pretty yet. 
But we in the church are like these rocks. And there's a song that we sing, especially at this worship service, there's a song that we sing that says, I will break their hearts of stone and give them hearts for love alone. And so what happens is if you take rocks, two or more rocks, and you put them together with a little bit of water, like what we use for baptism for your sister in a few minutes, and you start rolling them around together, they will change each other. Did you know that? They'll change each other. Do you know what they change into? What? Now, they're still rocks, but they look different. They start to look smooth. And note, it's almost kind of shiny, isn't it? This is a heart-shaped stone made out of the same rock as these. So if you roll this around with the other stones, it will look like this. This is a stone that's called malachite. And you'll notice that somebody then took the smooth polished stone and they made it into what shape? A heart. A heart, right? Because God will take our hearts of stone and give us hearts for love alone. That's what we sing. And so what I've done is I wanted you to see that when you're in the church, God is taking us from this into this. And so what I have is after the, the children's worship and after we have the sermon, we're going to have an anointing where you can get a special blessing. And when people come up and do that, I have miniature hearts of all different kinds of stones all behind the altar rail. There's a little trough behind the altar rail. And then you can come up and they're different colors. They're all the same size and shape. They're a little smaller than mine because I'm going to take this one with me and put it on my desk at my new church. But I wanted you, if you would like it, to have a, a sign, a remembrance that the church changes us, right? It smooths out our rough edges and it helps us to shine that light of Jesus Christ. And we can all be different, right? So there's different colors up there and you can pick whatever color that you would like. And then you can have your own polished heart that was made out of rough stone. Does that sound okay? All right. All right, well, we have a big moment right now, right? Because someone's getting baptized. Is it you? No, who's getting baptized? Lexi's getting baptized. Are you ready to bring your parents up? All right, my dear, let's do it. Let's come up here. We're gonna bring you all right up here if you will be so kind. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to read some words, Miss Lexi. Absolutely, thank you. We're going to read some words, and then I'm going to ask your parents some questions. And these are the same questions that your parents answered when we baptized your brother. So these are some real special words, okay? And then one day, they can be yours. Sound good? When you're ready. Okay. My siblings in Christ... Through the sacrament of baptism, we are incorporated into Christ's holy church. We are initiated through God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift, offered to us without price. And so now, on behalf of the church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, please say, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, please say, I do. And now you, my siblings in Christ and the body of Christ, will you nurture Alexandra in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she will be guided to accept God's grace for herself, profess her faith openly, and lead a Christian life. If so, please say, we will. We will. Okay. All right. I'm going to put the water in, sir, and then we're going to let you test it after I bless it. Good? Okay. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, almighty God, on this gift of water. From the very beginning, the scriptures recount how you used water to bring forth order and life, creation out of chaos. How you used water to create a safe pathway for your people, the Israelites, as they were fleeing from bondage and slavery in Egypt to the promised land, a place overflowing with milk and honey and hope. 
how you use that same Jordan River to be parted to show your blessing upon the prophet Elisha, and how our same Lord and Savior came to that blessed River Jordan and there received his baptism. This day we ask that you would send forth the Holy Spirit to imbue these waters with your power and grace, tangible signs of your love and your forgiveness for your beloved child, Alexandra. Lexi, for all of her ways, may she be enriched and blessed through this. And long after the waters of baptism dry, may she know with all that she is that there is a peace of God's self for her, always and everywhere with her, to the end of days and beyond. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Yes. All right, would you like to test that, sir? Let me know how you think it is. Good. It's good. Do you want to feel it? Would you like to try? Go ahead, my dear. Yeah, you can touch it. How does it feel? Not too cold, not too hot? Okay. All right. Now, Miss Lexi, would you like me to hold you, or would you like to just come over here? You can come over here, and your mom can come with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of water, and it's probably going to roll down your head a little bit, okay? I just want you to be comfy. Okay. Here we go. Alexandra, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious and loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit on Alexandra. Allow her to live into the promise of the fruitfulness of your presence with her. She is already growing with so much love with her family and her friends, and now this body of Christ. Fill her with your wisdom. Allow her to be a vessel of your love and forgiveness. And may her words and deeds, her very life, overflow with acts of compassion, mercy, love, and kindness. May your will be done in her and through her, always and everywhere. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well done, my dear. And so I have your shell here. Would you like it now, or do you want me to hold it for you? I will hold it for you. And then at the end, we're going to give you your certificate and all of your good things, okay? All right. Now, do you two want to stay in here for the service, or do you want to go to children's worship? What do you think? Want you want to go to children's worship. All right. Here comes Mr. Burt. Here he comes. Fantastic. And so he's going to take you, and then he's going to bring you back, Okay. So you're not going to miss anything. We're going to bring you back, and then you're going to get to get those, those stone hearts. Did you see them? As you go out, you can peek and see all the different kinds that we have, okay? All right. There you go. And you've got Ms. Lila May going with you, too. Fantastic. And so as we continue this morning... With our opportunity to worship together, we are thankful for all that God has already done through Lexi, has poured out God's Holy Spirit upon her, and is nurturing her even now in this moment. As those beautiful waters dry, she is going to feel God's presence forevermore, and we rejoice in that. And so let me grab my scripture, and we will get to hear God's word for us this day. Before we do, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, you ask us to listen to you, to hear your word and to allow it to become part of who we are becoming, to transform us from mere Christians to disciples, from those who believe to those who follow our Lord. And so we ask that by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, that same gift that was poured out upon Alexandra, that we might have the opportunity to grow in your love and to embrace your divine wisdom to be perfected by what we hear, and to go forth transformed to better serve others in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May your will be done in us and through us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to hear these words from the Gospel account of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 54 through 58. <clears throat> Jesus came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue, so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph, Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. 
But Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Um, so today is my final worship service with you. And it has already been uh, quite a morning. And as we are building toward this moment when I will be officially laying down my mantle of authority with you and leaving it here for Christy to pick up on her first Sunday. It gave me time to reflect on not only what we have experienced and learned and grown through in the last eight years that I have been here, but what God wants us to take forward into the next iteration of our ministry. Mine with the people of Warwick Memorial and Christie's with you here. And part of that kept coming back to me was about of course, God's grace. It all comes down to grace. It's always been about grace, and praise be to God, it will always be about grace in the United Methodist Church. It's about God's unmerited favor, that love that God pours out on us and for us. And so just as you've seen with Lexi, God is constantly trying to show us an outward, invisible, tangible signs that God is with us and for us, because God needs us to not only be with and for God, but with and for one another. And we hear in the gospel account of Matthew this day what happens when we aren't for one another. Can you imagine? I have read this text many times throughout the course of my life. I think every now and then it may come up in the lectionary. It comes up and we hear it and we listen to the fact that the scriptures testify that there was a time where Jesus' power was truncated. It was capped. It was limited. It was not unleashed. It was shackled. And the cause of that was human unbelief. Didn't think we were that powerful. Didn't think that we could stop the Son of Man, the Son of God, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, from doing what God wants to do because we won't have faith. And yet, that's exactly what the scriptures are telling us today. Not that Jesus didn't do any mighty acts of power, but that he couldn't do as many because he couldn't overcome the level of their unbelief. And when I look back on the last eight years, I have to tell you, there are colleagues of mine, many of whom are, are either now retired or they have claimed the promise of the resurrection, and they would be astounded to find out that I have been with you for eight years. Astounded! In fact, when I first graduated from seminary in 2008 and started attending the annual conference, that annual gathering of all of the clergy and the lay delegates of the Virginia Annual Conference, I met a clergy person who was in his 90s. And he told me that he could remember when his ministry started. And every year you had your spouse, if you had one, pack up all of your belongings and then the clergy spouse or the clergy person went to annual conference to find out one, if they were moving and two, where. We've gotten a little better. I remember I also had clergy friends, older, more vintage clergy friends who told me that they can remember when they used to move every two years like clockwork, every two years. Even the military does three every two years. And then some of you may remember there was a very long protracted period where Methodists, especially in the Virginia Annual Conference, it was every four years. Every four years you were getting a new pastor and your pastor was getting a new people. And that was the way it was. Well, we, we, we tried to reflect on that. Is that fruitful? Is that what we should be doing? And so now it's more taking it as a case-by-case -case basis, giving us the opportunity every year to reflect both as the congregation's leadership representatives and the staff pastor parish relations committee, or in our case, since we have gone to the simplified accountable structure, our church council, but the opportunity to have them reflect, how are things going? Do the, do the needs of the congregation still match with the gifts and graces of the pastor? And for the pastor to say the same thing, how is it going? And do your gifts and graces still match where things are going? Or are you feeling called to go somewhere else or do something else? There is a box for retirement. So you have to figure out what's going on there. And every year we're given that opportunity to ponder. And if things seem to be going well, then we commit to each other for another year. And hopefully the bishop and all of the district superintendents who form the cabinet affirm that. And you're here for another year. So it has been eight years that they have affirmed that and I have been here. 
However, you can never say that you know exactly how long you're gonna be anywhere. Although my last church, I was the associate pastor for eight years, and now I've served here for eight years. And when I met with the staff pastor parish relations committee of Warwick Memorial, one of the first questions we ask is, how long do you think you'll be here? And I said, well, that's between God and the bishop. But I did eight years and eight years, so I'm hoping around eight years. And they were like, we can work with eight. So here's the issue for us, though, is that, again, because we know that our clergy itinerate within Methodism, we have to figure out how that we can support that system and how we can best engage with it to be fruitful for ourselves. Now, there are other churches and other denominations that have other forms of polity, how they organize themselves, and sometimes that works out very well. Some of them have lapses in pastoral coverage because of how they organize themselves. So sometimes there might be a real lag between when you get your clergy. You technically don't have a lag in the United Methodist Church. Our bishop has done something a little different than what previous bishops have done in that she has declared the last Sunday of June to be Laity Sunday. Now, there are plenty of clergy who aren't moving that are going to be preaching next Sunday. But for those of us who are moving, it's giving us an opportunity to get moved and get settled and set our offices up and all of that before we officially start in, on July 1st. So she's kind of handled that for us so that we aren't completely discombobulated, only semi-discombobulated, which I appreciate for our bishop. And so while I was at this, this conference, I kept reflecting on, you know, what, what kind of legacy do you want? And I hope when you think about my time with you, you think about the things that we have done, the people that we have served, the people that we have blessed. I hope that you look back and you think about, you know, sometimes they almost become kind of catchphrases because we know clergy, we say them all over and over again about God's grace and unmerited favor or about the bright and beautiful future that God wants for us. Our best days are not behind us. They are ahead of us. And they will culminate in this incredible, bright and beautiful future that is the kingdom to come. We talk about how we recognize that we have work to do and that we have been doing great work and we celebrate that, but then we look for the next nudging of the Holy Spirit, the next direction from God Almighty, sending us to the next place where we can serve and love in the name of Jesus Christ, that we are not stagnant in our faith, but instead embodied in our faith, that we might go forth and do wonderful things so that others might come to know God. Now, I know that I am a slightly quirky pastor, and I know that I have other things that I have taught you kind of unintentionally, uh, one of which is now emblazoned on this wooden bookmark here. Um, one of our congregants, one of, one of our family of faith who was unable to be here today, last Sunday, said, I'm not going to be here, um, but he does word, 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 woodworking, and he wanted me to have this bookmark. And on the front, it says Crozet UMC 2016 to 2024. Those, of course, the years at which I have appoint, been appointed here as your clergy. And then on the other side, it says, well... Jesus was snarky too. And I was like, this is the Bible bookmark I have needed my whole life. And so it goes in. And so every time I open up my Bible at Warwick Memorial, a part of me, maybe externally, will snicker. And so, yeah, we, we did that little mini-series about snarky Jesus. We have traversed all over the scriptures. We have explored all kinds of topics. In fact, one of them apparently uh, at my new church had done a deep dive into our church's website and was like, are you going to do that toxic Christianity thing? I was like, I've already done that. We got to do new things. And they were like, I really liked it. I'm like, well, that's why Crozet has it online for you, that you may go and like it and drive up their web business. There you go. So instead, we think about where are we going and what are we going to do? But I have to tell you that one of the things that I reflect on now is how I read this passage differently as a pastor. My first appointment, you know, there were two of us. And so, you know, uh, people are very happy to assign blame and, and celebration. And with two of us, there was a 50-50 chance that it wouldn't be my fault. <laughs> there was a 50-50 chance that, like, it was either going to be both of our faults or his fault, right? But when you're a solo pastor, whether it's good or it's bad, it's your fault. And that's a reality, right? Because I am the clergy person here. And I know that it appears like I'm really in charge. I know that it appears that way. That's a mind trick. But really what happens is that we are in this together. And so when, when things go wrong, yes, I am the first person to tell you that I make mistakes, that I am fallible and flawed. I'm the first person to tell you I long ago send away the grace of my baptism. <laughs> 
long ago, which is why I am so glad that God allows me the incredible gift of taking communion, not just monthly, but twice on that first Sunday, just to make sure I'm covered. I, I appreciate that because, yeah, I have made mistakes. I have made bad decisions. But I want you to know this, and I'm telling you this standing before God and you and anyone else, that the mistakes that I have made never came from maliciousness. They came from my deep and passionate love for you and my desire to serve you to the best of my ability. And I'm flawed. And sometimes I thought I was making the right choice or doing the right thing. Sometimes I thought I was understanding something correctly and I was wrong. And I repent of that, that I have done things that have caused harm or that I have done things that have failed you. But I want you to know what was in my heart. My heart was one that it was for love alone for you. And the difference here in what the scripture is saying is that we need to make sure that we have our faith in the right place. Now, we all know that the Apostle Paul says, faith, hope, and love abide, and the greatest of these is love. And last week, I talked to you about the power of hope. Don't diminish the power of hope just because it's not as great as love. Hope is important, but the other one is faith. And we often think that it's only about faith in God. But I stand here before you today to tell you, after eight years of ministry, that it is not just faith in God that we must have. We need to have faith in the God that is in each of us as well. Because I have had times where I have been assailed by harsh condemnation, times where I have been maligned, where I have been attacked not just professionally but personally. I have times where in my ministry here where I have seriously been hurt and wounded and those scars will never go away. And they came from times when people decided that they should expect great deeds from me but have no faith in my ability to do them. Jesus couldn't overcome that. How am I? But more importantly, my siblings in Christ, how will Christy if we continue that? We can't do that. We need to have it. I can't tell you, sometimes in the darkest moments of my ministry, when I didn't think I was going to make it through a week physically, and I would get up on Sunday morning, and I always get up at 6 a.m., and I'm getting myself you know, showered and cleaned and prepped and ready, and the whole time, I would be praying to God, just let me get through. Just let me get through. Let me preach what you need me to preach. Let me do what I need to do. Pray what I need to pray. Let me be effective because it is only by your grace that I'm going to get through this day. And then I can collapse. Whatever you need me to do, Lord, I can die, but I need to get through this day. And it would be so dark that I would be praying that the whole time. And I would come here, and even if I were the first person here, as our, our staff and our worship teams would start to show up, and they would greet me, and I would be like, okay, well, I'm not alone. God is reminding me that I'm not alone, that there are others. And so that gives you a little hope, and it helps you get a little more prepared, and your you know, heart rate kind of falls down a little bit, and you're ready to go forth. But I want you to know this. You should never discount the power of your kind words and actions, ever. Don't ever discount them. You may never realize the difference that it makes when you shake a hand or you offer a hug or a smile or a kind word of greeting or even a kind word of, I just want you to know I appreciated this or I'm really glad that we do that. Don't underestimate the power of that because there were many times in eight years where that helped me climb a mountain. Because it takes a lot of positivity to overcome the negativity. It takes a lot because all clergy, I'm going to say this and I try not to speak in the imperative, all clergy have been called by God. We have been called by God in the United Methodist Church. We are vetted by the church in prayerful discernment and repeated forms of checking back and making sure that we're consistent. And then for those of us who are licensed, commissioned, or ordained, we go through not just the vetting process and the educational process, but then there is the process that happened yesterday morning. And that is when a bishop who is consecrated for this very purpose blesses you. And when you're being ordained, they lay hands on you and you become the prophet Elisha. You remember Elisha? Not Elijah, Elisha. 
Elijah was getting ready to get his retirement. I assume that's what it is when you go up to heaven in a chariot of fire. <laughs> getting his retirement. And so he had Elisha, who was his second, coming with him. And they get to, of course, this is what Elijah would do. They get to the River Jordan, and he takes his mantle, and he smacks the River Jordan, and the River Jordan parts, because I guess Elijah doesn't want wet feet. And they walk over on dry land, and they get to the place where Elijah knows that God is going to take him up. And before he goes, Elisha looks at him and goes, I need a second portion of the Spirit of God. I can't do this without that. I need a double helping. I need a second scoop. And so Elijah says, well, that's not my decision. That's really God's decision. And if that's what God wills, then you will do that. So in order for you to have the best chance, I suggest that you try to watch me ascend in glory and see what happens. And so Elisha goes, okay, and he's watching, and I guess he gets to see it pretty well, but then what happens? The mantle falls to the ground. He picks up the mantle. He walks over to the Jordan River, and he smacks the Jordan River, and it parts. <laughs> he has the double portion of the Spirit. My siblings in Christ, this is what every ordained clergy person, deacon or elder, yearn for in the very center, the core of our being. We yearn for that. Because I'm telling you right now, we cannot do it without it and we can't do it alone. We need it. Baptism is not going to be sufficient. We need that portion. And so my role, because I have friends in high places who were like, I need your help, was to stand behind this big curtain leading up to the chancel on the side. There's a big curtain. You can't see me, even with my heels. I'm behind the curtain, and I'm standing there, and there's a stairway up into the raised platform. And my job, as part of the Board of Ordained Ministry, was to stand there, and when everybody was getting queued up behind to come up on stage, my job was to make sure they didn't go too early and that they went on time, and that, like, you didn't drift into this person's group. You go in with your group. And so that was my job, and we did that for licensing. And if you watch it, you'll see the graded purity that happens. If you watch, when the bishop blesses those who are licensed, like my new associate pastor, there's no direct laying of hands. There's, a, there's an altar rail between her and them, and they stand, and she does this, and then they are blessed. And then when the provisional elders and deacons come up, they kneel at that altar rail, and she's on the other side of that altar rail, and she does a little bit of laying of hands, but never on the head. And she does a little bit of laying hands and invocation for each one of them, because they're a little closer to that double portion of the Holy Spirit. But the, the culmination is when we ordain deacons and elders. And at that point, they come up one at a time. One at a time, they come up onto that holy chancel. And there they kneel before the bishop alone. And this year, we had another visiting bishop. So there's two bishops. And our bishop puts her hand on their head. And the other one puts their hand on them. And then they are allowed to have elders and deacons who have been their support and their friends. And they come and they lay hands on their shoulders. And then they're allowed to bring a family member. I brought my son when I was ordained. And they normally put their hands. Mine decided to kneel and be blessed. I don't know. So, we, you know, we, we, not scripted. So we, you know, you're there and all these hands are on you and then the bishop says those words, take the authority for the office of a deacon or an elder. Pour out your Holy Spirit once more and says your name. That's that double portion. And so after we had done the deacons, there was a line of elders because there's always more elders than deacons. And I'm standing here and there was this incredible colleague of mine that I'd interviewed and gotten to see at the Board of Ordained Ministry as she was coming through and doing her ordination interviews and we're standing there and she's, you know, it, it's always amazing because I get the best picture. I'm there with them and some of them are like shaking and some of them are like joker size smile, just so excited. And others of them are like, I'm, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna cry, I'm not gonna cry, totally crying. You know, you never know what's gonna happen because the power and the spirit is so strong. You never know. And she's standing there and she's trying to like do the breathing thing and she's like, I'm talking a little bit to her. I'm like, you're going to be awesome. It's going to be great. But she's the first elder to go, so no pressure, right? And so she's standing there, and I said, you know, this is your Elisha moment. The you that kneels down will not be the you that rises because you're about to get a double portion of the Holy Spirit, and you are going to be different, and you will be changed, and I am so excited for you, and I am so excited for us. You're going to make us better. And I'm thrilled with that. And she looked at me, and I, I'm like, you know, the kind of tear thing. And she's like, thank you. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Shouldn't have done that right before you. 
But it's one of those moments where you realize the power of that moment. And when she got up there and she knelt and she stood up, and that room of thousands of Virginia Methodists erupted into applause, it's a moment where you look out into a room that you cannot fathom the vastness of. You look out into a room and you see all those people who have faith in you and it changes you. You feel like you could leap a mountains. You can go up without the chariot. You feel so empowered. And that's what we need. We need to know that you believe in us. At least believe in the Christ in us. We need to know that that is true. Come on in, guys. Because if not, we can't do what we have to do. And so, Lexi just got that first dose of the Holy Spirit. And if she decides that God has placed a call upon her life and she goes through those steps, she'll get that second call. She'll get that second portion of the Holy Spirit. But if not, God is going to call others and put that second portion of the Holy Spirit on them for her and you. And God's going to do that. But if you don't have the faith, at least in the God that called them, at least in the God that has equipped them and ordained them, then all of this is for nothing because we will just atrophy and we will truly become a denomination on hospice. And I don't think anybody wants that to happen. The world needs the grace of United Methodism. The world needs a place where all are welcome at the font and at the table and in the sanctuary. The world needs this kind of love and articulation that you are beloved, a being of sacred worth and that no one can strip that from you. Everybody in the world needs to know that. And if we allow our relational issues with other human beings to exceed our faith in them, then we are condemning this denomination to death. And Christy is coming here to be your pastor. And nobody looks at all of these incredibly bright and beautiful people who are just licensed, commissioned, and ordained and goes, yep, the future is dark. Yep, yep. All right, people, funeral next. That's not what happens. We're energized and we're excited and we're really thrilled. And people are really thrilled until they post like what the appointments are and they're like, oh, I thought we were getting him. No, you've got to be excited about the Christ that is coming to you. The second portion of the Holy Spirit that God is sending here to you because God doesn't make us all the same. If you don't believe me, just look at me standing with a bunch of my peers. We don't all look the same. Some of them are short. And then I want to I share with you something that happens about why it is so important. I told you that it's important. Well, last week in the midst of this, because my parents are moving tomorrow to Newport News, and then two days later I'm moving to Newport News, so it's been a little busy, right? And I got a phone call. One of our family of faith has a sister who was here for a child's birthday party in the family, and she went into labor early. She was only 17 weeks along, and she gave birth to this child that could not survive. And they're over at the hospital, and would I come? And yeah, okay, yeah, I'll go. And I went, and I thought to myself, God, what, <laughs> what am I going to do here? What am I going to do? And I went in there, and I want you to know that this is one of those moments where I totally understood what God does with Christians. I want you to know this. This is one of these paradigm-shifting moments for me. I will never forget this. I got in that room, and the mom and the dad are sitting on the bed, and they are holding their baby. They are holding her, and she is so tiny and so beautiful. And they're holding her, and I've never met these people before. And I come into the room, and the sister, who I do know, is like, thank you for coming course and I get in there and mom says why did God do this to me and I said I don't know that we'll ever know what happened but I know this I know that God loves your baby and God loves you and God wanted your baby to have life and have it abundantly 
And for whatever reason, that didn't happen. And so God is mourning with you right now. And I want you to know that I believe that God is holding that baby for you. And I, don't, I can't cite you scripture for this, and I, 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 can't, I, mean, I can't give you doctrine for this. I said, but I believe that one day you're going to see your baby again. I said, is this your first baby? And she said, yeah. I said, I lost my first baby too. And in that moment, God redeemed the loss of my baby because she looked at me and she's like, you get it, you know. And so we, we, I asked her, you know, do you want me to say a blessing over Riley? And she said, yes. And so I held Riley in my hands and I thought to myself, Riley was only six weeks older than my baby. And I couldn't do this with my baby. I couldn't hold my baby. But here I am with Riley. And so I prayed over Riley what I would have wanted somebody to pray over my baby. That God would hold her in God's loving arms. And when it was time, that God would restore this family. And that they would be reunited with Riley in a place where there is no sickness or death or sin or brokenness or sorrow or mourning or crying. And that in that place, they will be together for all time and nothing will ever separate them. And after that, I looked at her. And you know, sometimes, even in these moments where you think you did a good thing, the Holy Spirit's like, more. There is more. And so I looked at her, and I was like, I don't know her. This is really not my place. Like, this feels really awkward. And I love feeling awkward. I mean, I, like, I don't mind making y'all feel awkward. Me feeling awkward is a different thing. And so I looked at her, and I got down on her level. And I said, I need you to hear this. I need, I need you to know this. You did nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong. You didn't deserve to feel this way. You did not fail your child. Something tragic happened, and it is not your fault. And she just erupted. And that's why our faith is important. Because she didn't need me to come in there and cite text to her and discipline about why God doesn't do things like this to us. She didn't need that. She didn't hear, no, that's not correct. Let me tell you why. She didn't need that. She needed somebody to be a Christian and to love her and to give her hope and to let her know that one day there may be another child. But one day there is definitely a Riley waiting for her. She needed to know that. So when you wonder about what happens, if we make it impossible for clergy to do that hard work when it is vital, when it is necessary, because we have unbelief in our clergy, then we are doing harm to other people. We don't understand the ripple effect of that harm. We've got to have faith in each other. And so that means that we have to put in place Matthew 18. That's when we go to people and we say, you know, you said this or you did this and I don't agree with it or it really kind of upset me and we need to work through this because we are in this together. We are in this together. And I need you to unleash the double portion of the Holy Spirit that's in you, Pastor Christie. And I need that. Our church needs that. Crozet needs that. The world needs that. We need your gifts that the Holy Spirit gave to you to come into our midst and change everything. And so you have to have faith in her. You got to have the faith. Because we're all going to say and do things, and you're going to be like, that doesn't sound right at all. And it may not have been. But I guarantee you that behind every bad decision, misplaced word, error in judgment, flat out mistake, that there is a heart of Jesus Christ in that clergy person. Because I have told you, and I'm telling you again for the last time in worship, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And she's gonna come here and she's gonna love you with an everlasting love. And my siblings in Christ, I pray and hope and I urge you with all that I am, love her with an everlasting love. Love her. Because together there is no stopping you. 
There is no stopping you. One of the annual conference offerings this year was to uh, the nonprofit entity formerly known as RAP Medical Debt Relief. And some of you will know that, you know, a few years ago, we did our Advent and Christmas offering for that, and we raised $22,000 and eliminated $2.2 million of medical debt in Virginia, right? A few years ago. And so we got there, and they're introducing that this is what we're raising money for at annual conference this year. And a church that's a little larger than Crozet got up with a big old check and was like, our church raised $5,000. It's a good start. And we challenge your church to raise $5,000. And I looked at my friend and I was like, already done. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, we did that a few years ago. I'm glad the conference is finally following Crozet's trend. We did that. Do you realize that? We did something that the annual conference is just now figuring out and they didn't even do. This mighty mid-sized church did this. And do you believe Jesus Christ when he says your best days are ahead? That he is making all things new? Do you believe that? Oh, then you will do mightier acts than that. You will do mightier things. And she will be vital, crucial, integral to that. Pastor Christie is going to be important for that because God has given her different gifts. We all have different gifts. And on this journey, we're going to learn things about each other, things that we like, and things that we, quite frankly, aren't real fond about. We're going to learn things about each other, but you know what? Every time you have a struggle, you look for the Christ in the heart of the other. You look at them. There are all these stone hearts up here on the altar rail where in the past there were probably itty-bitty little Jesus cups back up here. Before we did intinction, there were probably all kinds of little cups up in, up in here. And now there are these hearts, right? And if anybody, it's a traditional worship person that remembers, right? Here I am, Lord. That song, that hymn, I will break their hearts of stone and I will give them hearts for love alone. And that's what God is doing. God is going to rub you and Christy together until your roughness falls away and you shine like the sun. And I'm not talking about that burning ball of gas up there. I'm talking about the son of God. You will shine like that. And darkness will flee before the people of Crozet United Methodist Church. So believe in her. And when you are weak, may she believe in you. Because that is the only future that we're going to have. And I've got to go to a place where I hope and pray that they're going to believe in me. And that they're going to believe in Sean, the other pastor. And all I can do, I can't fix them yet or at all. But all I can do is tell you that I know what it is like to have someone expect great deeds from you and have no faith in your ability to do them. It is one of the worst feelings in the world. And there is no redemption from it. Not like there was with my miscarriage when I could connect with a mom and offer her only child, a blessing. That's a redemptive moment. When we harm each other in that level, we leave permanent scars. But you can decide. You have the power. And just remember that. Remember your power. She isn't coming here to take your power. She is coming here to bring the power of that double portion of the Holy Spirit and to unite with your power and to take Crozet to the next iteration of its ministry. Believe in her. Believe also in the Christ in her. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And now we are going to have a moment to kind of Sit and pray and ponder and meditate and worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.
Please rise for the doxology. Almighty God, we have faith in you. Help us to grow our belief in each other so that our missions and our ministries, fueled by our faith and by these gifts, will be able to overcome all obstacles, will be able to reach further and more profoundly into the community, will be able to bless those in need and multiply the fruits of our work. And may we, who are here with you this day, no matter where we go, experience the connectivity of you through prayer, through our union with the love of Jesus Christ, and through our commitment to meet again in the kingdom to come. Until then, may your will be done always and everywhere. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It is traditional in the life of Crozet United Methodist Church that well predates my time with you on fifth Sundays to have a portion of our worship service that is about prayer and anointing, an opportunity to receive not a sacrament, but an outward and visible sign of God's blessing and love. And God has used this all throughout the scriptures and throughout the ages, the tradition of not just Christianity, but of our other siblings of the Abrahamic faith, in order to remind us that sometimes People would come seeking the anointing in order to find healing in body or to be able to feel comforted as they were approaching their own mortality. There were times that people came because they needed to have that blessing so that they could do hard, difficult work in ministry ahead. Kings and priests and prophets. And then there were times where God uses this to underscore that God is just with us. And so we offer this as a final opportunity to receive one last blessing. And so I will offer a prayer over our balm. It is a mixture of olive oil and petroleum jelly, and it is infused with frankincense and myrrh, these aromatic fragrances that were used not only in the worship in the tabernacle and in the temple, but also throughout Christianity, especially at Christmas and Epiphany. And so if you would like to receive that, you are welcome to come forward. You can receive the sign of the cross on your head or your hand if you prefer. And you are welcome, if you would like to, to take one of these heart-shaped stones as a reminder of how God has been working on us and through us. And then you will have a reminder to have faith in the heart that God has placed within Christy. Let us pray. God, as we prepare once more to experience a tangible and outward and visible sign of your presence and your love, your blessing through the anointing, we are grateful for you, for all the ways in which you reach out to us before we even acknowledge your presence, for the ways in which you seek to be our strength and our comfort in times of great need, in times of change and transition, in times of sickness and in healing, in times of life and in death. And especially, Lord, in times when we are struggling internally and externally, that we might experience that aromatic fragrance of frankincense and myrrh and be reminded that Christ came, not that we should be condemned, but healed. And so we seek your healing in body, mind, heart, and spirit. May your will be done for us, and may we encounter you in this blessing in a way that gives us the strength, the courage, and the empowerment to be disciples and to share this blessing with others. May it be so. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I invite you to come forward as you feel ready and led.
Let us pray. Almighty God, sometimes we cannot fathom the impact of a touch, a kind glance, a gracious word. And yet today, by your ordinance, we have received all of these. And so we pray that as we go forth from this place where the fragrance of frankincense and myrrh fill the air, that long after that incredible scent dissipates, that your presence and your touch, your blessing shall remain, that we will internalize when you say that we are blessed and loved, and that it will become so much a part of who we are that we will grant that grace to others, that they are beloved of sacred worth, a blessing, and to be blessed. May your will be done in us and through us this day and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And now we have a liturgy for you. Now come on up here, though. Okay. <laughs> Please join us when indicated as we join together in this farewell for Pastor Sarah. Brothers and sisters of Crozet United Methodist Church, today we bid farewell to Pastor Sarah Wastella. We are thankful for her commitment, her service, and her ministry. Thank you, members and friends of Crozet United Methodist Church, for the love and the support that you have shown me while I have ministered among you. I am grateful for the ways that my leadership has been accepted, and I ask forgiveness for all the mistakes that I have made. And as I leave, I carry with me all that I have learned here. We receive your thankfulness, offer forgiveness, for your time among us. We ask your forgiveness for our mistakes. Your influence on our faith and faithfulness will not leave with your departure. I accept your gratitude and your forgiveness, and I forgive you as well, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to God. I release you from turning to me and depending on me. I encourage your continuing ministry here. And I will pray for you and for Pastor Christy Hagaturma. And I ask that you will now join me in this prayer together to prepare for her time. Eternal, Eternal God, God whose steadfast, steadfast love for us is from, from everlasting to everlasting. To we give you thanks, thanks for, for cherished memories and commend one another into your care as we move in new directions. Keep us one in your love forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Siblings in Christ, the stole is a sign of ordination in the United Methodist Church. Eight years ago, you presented this as a welcome to this body of Christ. And today, I relinquish the stole as I complete my ministry here at Crozet United Methodist Church. Maybe. <laughs> I didn't have this headset then. Okay. Goodness. All right. Remind Christy to be mindful of the microphone. <laughs> yes. I don't know how old this stole is, but it's also backward. It is a white stole, which is the symbol that we use for sacraments. That's why it's given to clergy on their first Sunday, because we begin our relationship with Holy Communion. And this stole has on it CUMC, and it has on it the cross, and the flame, and the dove, and the ichthys. And so we hope and pray that as we wear these roles, these stoles, 
that they will remind you not just of our call, but our commitment. And so I leave this for her. Pastor Sarah, in recognition of your commitment, service and leadership, we offer these gifts and thanks for you and your ministry. A prayer shawl. Thank you. Assigned uh, cards and letters from the congregation. Thank you. And a signed picture from council. <laughs> In the eight years you've been with us, you have been a part of so many amazing things. And for that, we are grateful. Let's take a look. Oh, 
Brothers and sisters of Crozet United Methodist Church, please join me in thanks for Pastor Sarah and her ministry. It's a wonderful thing to be able to conclude ministry with the people that you have loved with all that you are by a tangible reminder of God's love to be able to baptize Miss Lexi over here. Thank you, Lexi, for letting me do that. Thank you. I will remember this for always. Will you receive this benediction one more time? You are an incredible blessing and you are powerful, and your faith gives you strength that you may not yet realize. And so may you use that strength and that power to love and to have faith in others who come in the name of Jesus Christ, to walk alongside you, to serve you, and to lead you. And may you transform Pastor Christie as you have transformed me for the better. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen. Amen.